Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by HelloFresh. More about them in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another brand new episode of A Casual Criminalist. As always, hi there. I'm Simon. I'm your host. What happens here? One of my writers, in this case, Kevin, writes me a script. I've never read it before. That's the format. It's called A Cold Read. We explore it together. It's Pedro Rodriguez Filho, the Brazilian Punisher turned YouTuber. Doesn't it normally go the other way around? Like, I feel like we've covered stories before. It was like, yeah, this YouTuber, and then they murdered someone. And they uh, are now in prison. <laughs> I like that YouTube's been around so long that there are, like, people who've been on YouTube and now they're, like, serving, like, life sentences for, like, major crimes. You're like, holy <laughs> Don't write down your crimes. We've talked... Don't commit crimes on YouTube. What are you up to? Uh, Brazilian Polish return to YouTuber. Let's jump into it, shall we? One of my favorite comic book series of all time is Punisher War Journal number four from 2007. That is so specific, Kevin. Is this like the Punisher? Like the Brazilian Punisher, the Punisher. I've seen that TV show with the guy from um, the, the other TV show. Brilliant stuff, Simon. Well done, big brain. Uh, the one with the zombies, The Walking Dead. And uh, I was watching that with my wife and we were really enjoying the show. It's like, this is good. This is like exciting. Like, I don't really remember what it was about, but there was one scene where it's just like out of nowhere. He just starts beating the out of some dude, like punching him in the face until there's just no face left. And uh, my wife and I turned off that show and we're like, well, that went too far, didn't it? <laughs> it's like, this was a nice show. I mean, yeah, it was a bit violent, but then it was like, I didn't sign up for gore the punisher as i know i'm watching a comic book series so it's gonna be like there's gonna be too much gore and all this it's like going to a quentin tarantino movie you know there's gonna be too much on people like simon there's not too much gore in quentin tarantino's movie it's his style i'm like there's too much gore in Tar- quentin tarantino's movies i like quentin tarantino's movies less because there's so much gore and so we found i'm not a huge tarantino fan anyway i love that hollywood one but then it gets to the end and it's like why 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 it's not necessary <laughs> The story, titled Small Wake for a Tall Man, takes place at a bar with no name where a group of nobody supervillains are holding a wake for the equally unimportant Stilt Man. Despite being the purveyors of cartoons, supervillainy was pretty much what you'd expect from any wake. People drank and talked about the good old days with their fallen comrades. One of the villains in attendance had even fixed up a broken Doombot, a member of Doctor Doom's army of robotic doppelgangers. Oh, comic books. <laughs> I'm just like... I wonder if I could care less. Uh, he had brought it into the we- into the wake to make Stiltman's wife, Princess Python, think that her husband had made it to the big leagues and the real Doom was in attendance to mourn his death. It was a real sweetheart move. At one point, even Spider-Man showed up to pay his respects. It was a cute little story that showed a side of the villains that nobody ever thinks about. Of course, this was still a Punisher comic, so there's no way this story was going to have a happy ending. Yeah, it's like, hey, sorry to hear about your loss princess and it just ends with her face being beaten in by a dude in the most violent way by the punisher that the main dude was the punisher right oh my god that tv show too much punisher too much (laughs) why Late into the wake, one of the villains goes to get a drink and notices that the bartender has disappeared. No sooner does he make this realization than we see Frank Castle, who had naturally been the bartender in disguise, detonating a bomb to blow up the bar and everyone inside it. Wait, is Frank Castle the Punisher? Is that his actual name? I don't remember. And I, uh, don't care. It didn't matter whether these were murderers or just pickpockets in funny costumes. In the eyes of the Punisher, they were bad people and so they had to die. I feel like it's this sort of black and white thing, it isn't it? It's like, well, yeah, they're all bad dudes. Does it mean they all deserve to get blown up? No. It's like me and the death penalty. It's like most of the times that they deserve to get no, God no. But the people we cover on Casual Criminalists, like Pedro Lopez, yes, yes, no, he does need the death penalty. He does, but it's not a black and white issue. He killed like three hundred children. If you don't think he deserves the death penalty, it's like what? And people be like, well, you never know if they're fully innocent. Is it the state's place to take a life? And I'm like, well, if it's not the state's, like, hopefully someone will, like, let's just leave him in prison and uh, not put him in that solitary part and see see how long he survives. <laughs> let's, let's just do that. And then it'd be like, state didn't take his life. <laughs> it was another prisoner, wasn't it? And it was worse. And no one would care. Pedro is often referred to as the Brazilian Dexter, but this is not nearly as accurate. 
He did not only kill murderers, and he certainly didn't go to the lengths that Dexter did to make sure that the person was actually guilty before taking action. Pedro may insist that everyone he killed was bad, but I'll let you decide on your own as we chronicle the history of one of the most prolific serial killers of all time. No way! What? We tur turned YouTuber? The what? I mean, turned YouTuber can mean like, yeah, you put out a video, got 300 views. And it's like, okay, YouTuber. Um, I don't know what the line is. Obviously, that is a YouTuber. Simon, you're getting all snobby with your YouTube. Where's that? Where's that line, Simon? <laughs> when does someone pick? Well, I mean, like, you're not making a living off. Let's not. A professional YouTube person. Like, making a living off it. Don't be defeatist, dear. It's very middle class. I don't use that term lightly either. There's a good chance you've never heard of Pedro before, especially if you don't live in Brazil. I do not. Despite being not nearly as well known internationally as other serial killers, Pedro currently sits at number 6 on the leaderboard for most confirmed murders with 71, and it's suspected he has killed well over 100. Good lord. How have I never heard of this guy? And I think like, you know, being a YouTube person, I've been like, oh, I'm vaguely familiar with this, but no. Early life it should be made clear at the start that there's not a lot of information available about Pedro, and even less for those of us who have to rely on Google Translate because we don't speak Portuguese. Much of the information comes from Pedro himself, but he's not exactly a reliable narrator. For example, he likes to state that he was born on All Hallows' Eve because it sounds ominous, but that's a total lie. Pedro Rodriguez Filho was actually born on July the 17th, 1954. Filho is a generational suffix, the equivalent of junior. His father was Pedro Senior, but we don't even know his mother's name. That's how poor a lot of the records surrounding the case are. What we do know is that Pedro was born to be a killer. Don't they have Ancestry? Ancestry.com? Uh, or MyHeritage? Sponsor MyHeritage on another show. May I, you know? Maybe even sponsoring this video, who knows? Um, isn't that stuff fairly easy to look up? Like, if you know my name, you could, uh, you'd have to find the right person. This can't be that hard to research, can it? What we do know is that Pedro was born to be a killer. I'm guessing you've already had an idea where this is about to go, right? Oh my god, let me guess. Bad childhood. Abuse. Missing parents. Abusive parents. Abusive parents other people it's we know where this is going same old story everywhere you go this is casual criminalist after all so there's probably going to be some domestic violence and if we don't know his mother's name then she's probably not the guilty party wait what uh yes unsurprisingly pedro had a shitty childhood with an abusive father oh my god what no he did his father was such an abusive prick, he couldn't even wait for Pedro to be born to start abusing him, so Pedro Sr. kicked his wife in the stomach, and thus him in the head, while he was still in utero. Uh-oh, that's not going to be good. The result was Pedro was born with a bruised skull, so he likely inherited violent tendencies from his father, had a violent and abusive childhood, and even suffered severe head trauma before he was even born. With a start like that, I don't think anyone would have predicted that he would grow up to be anything other than a serial killer, but they also didn't have to wait very long to find out. Oh my god, this is such a bad start. Pedro grew up on a farm in Santa Rita de Sapacay and was the oldest child with seven younger brothers and sisters. With such a large family, the kids needed help to earn money, and as the oldest child, the bulk of that responsibility would fall on Pedro. In a different time or place, this could potentially have been a good thing. I'm not saying I'm in favor of child labor, but he had become an apprentice to a skilled and kindly tradesman. It may have provided an escape from the violence of his home. Yeah, child labor is such an interesting one, because now I have kids, and I, I'm often thinking, like, in the past, people have ki had kids to, like, help them on the farm and sh And then I was thinking, you know, as my career is you know, YouTube. Another big YouTube thing is these YouTube family channels. And my wife sometimes watches these. I guess she she doesn't really, mm, she does watch the ones with kids. Yeah, and I'm like, these kids are all up to this stuff and doing this and doing that. And it's being filmed and it's being like capitalized on. And I'm like, this is the same. <laughs> and it's kind of weird. And I know like in uh, obviously we've this has been going on forever with like child stars in movies and stuff. But at least in that, there's the um, there's some law that they introduce so the parents can't spend all the money if their kids get famous. But I don't think there's such a thing in existence for like non, I don't know if it's union or one of these guilds or whatever, you know, blah blah blah. But I don't think that same thing exists for like the YouTube world. 
And I'm like, this is, it's fairly intense. Like, you can imagine, like, hey, hey, sit down, make this video with me. And it's like, dad, I don't want to. We're doing it. It's like, okay. <laughs> it's like, that's intense, right? I mean, don't get any ideas. I would never do this. Um, but yeah, people do. It's weird. Unfortunately, this was not the case. What was not the case? Oh, him getting a job and becoming like a tradesman or whatever. And violence was all Pedro would ever know. We already established that his father was extremely abusive, but it actually turns out that his mother had a bit of it in her as well. She was referred to as a strict disciplinarian who ruled the house with an iron fist and a Bible and would not hesitate to beat the children if they got out of line. <laughs> they, <laughs> I don't want to laugh about it. I don't know why I'm laughing. I just have an image of a kid being beaten with a Bible, and it's not funny, so I don't know why I'm laughing at it. It's just like, I guess it's, it's so extreme that it's like uncomfortably funny that someone be beat. It's not funny, Simon. What's actually wrong with you? <laughs> What's wrong with your brain? Someone getting beaten with a book, a big book is not amusing. Even when it was time for Pedro to earn some money, Santa Rita would offer him more violence. It was a dangerous city full of gangs, drug dealers, and predators, and Pedro was going to have encounters with all of them. By the time he was 13 years old, Pedro was already too far gone. He was working at a sugarcane mill owned by his grandfather, and one day he got in a fight with an older cousin. Pedro had borrowed his cousin's horse without asking, so his cousin punched him in the face. That doesn't sound too outrageous of a response. <laughs> Wait, getting punched in the face for borrowing something without asking does seem a bit unreasonable. <laughs> I've never punched anyone in the face. Replace the word horse with car, and you may find that you'd respond similarly if someone borrowed it from you without asking. Whether the cousin's response was proportionate or not, Pedro's definitely wasn't. He shoved his cousin's arm into a sugar cane press. The machine flattened it and then jammed, but Pedro kept pushing him. He was still a stupid little kid that didn't understand that the machine could not flatten something as three dimension as an entire human body, but he repeatedly tried to push his cousin's head into it. He was only 13 years old and he was already trying to commit murder. Oh, good lord. Like, he's 13. I don't think for this act he should face any, like, you know, punishment as in going to, um, oh, what's the politically correct term for a borstal? A reform institute? Where kids go to prison. Kid prison. Well done, Simon. You found a much more PC term there. Kid prison. So he's going to go to kid prison and he'll just get more fed up. But I think what you need to do is at this point enter the picture doctors and therapists and uh yeah a deep look into his home life and his brain functioning because otherwise he's going to end up as a serial killer how would i know that other workers in the mill alerted the grandfather, who turned off the machine, and Pedro spent two full days in jail for his crime, but he was never charged. His grandfather opted not to press charges because the family needed Pedro to work and to make money. That's if the story ever happened, of course. It's the story Pedro told of the first time he felt the urge to kill, and it sounds equally parts believable and horrific. My only issue with the story is that the grandfather owned the sugarcane mill, so why not just leave Pedro in jail a little longer to hopefully learn a lesson and still give his family the money? that it have earned since they needed it. I don't know, you left him in there for two days. What do you want to do? Leave him in like for a month without charge? That sounds illegal. There's no confirmation that this assault ever happens, but it doesn't really matter if the story is true anyway. Aside from my one little gripe with the logic of the story, there'd be no reason for Pedro to make any of this up. What would be the point in lying about having these murderous impulses at the age of 13, when we know that his first murder was going to come the following year at the age of 14? Yeah, at first I was like, well, I don't know, he wants to like tell a story and build this ridiculous serial killer legacy that these guys, because they're all narcissists, often narcissists, come across. Um, they want to build like a, um, oh, what's it called? Like a legend. Uh, but no, it doesn't matter because he killed someone at 14. Now, look, are you watching this show thinking that, hmm, I could use something to eat right now. I could have some sort of delicious meal. Maybe you should have a delicious meal. In fact, no maybe about it. You should have a delicious meal prepared to you by today's video sponsor and our friends, HelloFresh. Look, HelloFresh is delicious. Look, it's, uh, well, my copy points say that it's fall. We call that autumn in the UK. Weird difference, isn't it? But look, you know, it's time to cozy up with del some delicious sweets and get the whole family involved with HelloFresh's limited edition kid-friendly baking kits. That is a new talking point. I don't even know that existed. I love that. Like, I don't know, my kid's nearly three years old. I don't... My wife sometimes says she makes cakes with her, but I think really my wife makes the cake and my kid watches 
but at some point she's gonna get involved she mixes she likes mixing so that's nice i like that they do that that's very cool you could be eating something right now made by your kids so they'd learn something as well that's brilliant look the most important thing among all of this for me is just how easy it is you don't have to fuss what happens with hello fresh is that they work to your schedule their plans are flexible you can change your meal preferences update your delivery day and even change your address with just a few taps on the hello fresh app that makes things even easier and also hello fresh can help re you reach your goals look if you want to be uh more healthy they've got fit and wholesome meals if you're a vegetarian a pescatarian whatever they also cater to that and uh, all of these are without sacrificing flavor so you're not like oh yeah i'm going to diet oh, no, i don't want to it's gonna be boring no hello fresh never sacrifices flavor and also it's sustainable so you can feel good about eating these delicious meals it really is just a win 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 they are the first carbon neutral meal kit company and nearly all the packaging is recyclable that's fantastic look all you need to do is go to hellofresh.com and use the code criminalist 16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts again hellofresh.com use the promo code criminalist 16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts and now back to today's show a life of crime Pedro Sr. worked the night shift as a security guard at a local high school. It wasn't an amazing job, and it didn't pay well enough to keep his children from needing to get jobs, but it still paid better than being unemployed. One day, he was accused of stealing food from the kitchen as well as some stationery. He maintained his innocence and said he suspected it was the day guard who had done it, but the deputy mayor fired him on the spot. Pedro, <laughs> that's pretty intense. You don't want to look into that a little bit more? He's like, no, it's the other guy. Although, I don't know, this guy kicked his wife in the baby in the womb and the head so it's like i don't know he kind of seems like a piece of shit, so oh no he lost his job for stealing stationery and he seems like the type of guy who, like, if he kicks his wife he can steal some stationery maybe the the day guy is is super awesome pedro couldn't let this disrespect of his family stand he took his grandfather's shotgun and killed the deputy mayor in front of city hall then escaped without being seen oh my god this family the pedro family they are big into escalation. It's like borrowed the car, got punched in the face. I put his arm in a sugarcane press, and now it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't really exist anymore. It's just very flat. And the other guy's like, no, the mayor disrespected me, so I murdered his ass. God damn, guys. Too far. Still not satisfied, he then killed the daytime security guard who his father believed had been the actual thief. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. This is Pedro Jr. doing this, of course, because we said this would be his murder. Oh my god. Considering that Petro is supposed to have a reputation for only killing murderers, we're off to a great start here. In his mind, these were bad people who had committed grave injustices, but there wasn't any proof that the security guard was the one to steal from the school. There wasn't any proof that Pedro Sr. had stolen anything either, so the firing was unwarranted, but murder doesn't feel like the appropriate answer here. This is like asking us, why did you kill these people? Um, like, you could, like, <laughs> I don't know, just any serial killer. Like, generic serial killer who murders college women being like why did you kill them they were bad people because they dressed inappropriately <laughs> i mean it's closer to that side of the scale than it is to you know dexter isn't it it's like 90 percent closer to that side of the scale 99 percent. this is insane you can't you can't this is not justified in any way now that he'd claimed his first two victims, it was time for Pedro to go on the run. He moved to Mogi de das Cruces, Greater Sao Paulo, to stay with his godmother, and it was here that he'd meet the love of his life, Maria Arapsida Olympia. Maria, who would soon become Pedro's girlfriend, went by the nickname Batinha, which means booty. That nickname gives me some real Caligula vibes, which is appropriate because Maria wasn't so much his girlfriend as she was his predator. Oh, good lordy. <laughs> Pedro was still only 14, but Maria was a grown-ass woman. Her exact age is impossible to pin down, but it sounds like she was probably late 20s to early 30s. He's 14. What the f***? <laughs> she was well known as a drug trafficker who would use her good looks to lure teenage boys to work for her and also sleep with them. It's nice when a manager has an open door policy, but that door isn't supposed to lead to the bedroom. Good God. This is f***ed up. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, no, and now you have to, now you've got to do some drug running. <laughs> oh my lord, this, this is like, this is really, you know, this is how murderers are made. Not that he wasn't already a murderer by this point. He was. 
twice over. And somehow, <laughs> in Portugal, not Portugal, sorry, they speak por uh, Portuguese in Portugal. In oh my god, Simon, where's your big brain today? Come on, um, in Brazil. It's like, what, in Brazil, they're just like, you can just move town. It's like, yeah, no, I murdered the mayor and a security guard in broad daylight. And where did you go? I went to live with my godmother. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine now. No one knows. <laughs> Brazil, get your shit together. Where's your uh, FBI? It was only local jurisdiction. Come on, the ones that go across the different states and and find people. What's the other one? The guys, uh, the, the... All of my knowledge is from TV. But the guys with the badges and the hats. Ah! Marshals! US Marshals? Where they go and they're like, I'm gonna go across that border and bring me back my quarry. <laughs> Why is there a TV show about that with the dude? Um, doesn't matter. Let's just move on. Oh my god, Simon. You can't remember anything today. I'm definitely getting that brain disease. So Pedro got to work moving drugs, robbing other criminals since they weren't likely to call the cops, occasionally murdering other drug dealers, and being sexually abused on the regular. He was clearly Maria's favorite and quickly moved up the ranks. This led to a lot of jealousy amongst the other boys who were wondering why he kept advancing ahead of those that had been with her much longer. I mean, <laughs> again, this is one of those things where it's like maybe because he's more competent. And I don't want to like praise competence here because competence is like murdering other people, being better at slinging drugs, murdering other drug dealers. Like, but you, it's weird when companies are like, we should promote this person because they've been with us longer. When there's someone who's new, who's clearly far more competent. It's a mer It should be a meritocracy. The person who's more competent should get promoted. Right? <laughs> and if the people who don't like that, they can leave and we can find some more competent people. Is that a bit savage? It feels a bit savage saying that, but it's like, yo, I'm sorry, but the better people should be rewarded. One day, three of the other boys invited Pedro to come and smoke some weed with them. He went, but he felt like something wasn't right. He noticed that all of them were armed, which he was as well, because they were all drug dealers, so of course they were. Regardless, Pedro got it in his head that they wanted to kill him, so he pulled out his gun, aimed at them, and demanded they drop their weapons. I love Kevin's American. It's like, they were drug dealers, so of course they were armed. <laughs> it's like growing up in the UK, drug dealers don't have guns. <laughs> At least not like the, the you know, the drug dealer would go buy your weed off. <laughs> It'd be very weird if he had a gun. No one would buy weed off him. And so I pull out my gun! Woo! The other boys complied, and as soon as their weapons were on the ground, he began opening fire, killing two of them and sending the third to the hospital. Pedro got a reputation for being someone not to fuck with, and he began seeing himself as a sort of heroic vigilante. All of the people he had killed since moving to Sao Paulo were drug trafficking criminals and possibly murderers as well. The fact that he was one as well wasn't terribly important because he had a way to justify his actions. It was also around this time that he earned the nickname Pedrino Mantador, Portuguese for Killer Petey. The killer part's pretty obvious, and the somewhat childish name of Petey seems to be because he was relatively small in stature. Probably. His actual height isn't available anywhere, and pictures of him don't give a great frame of reference. It's possible it was one of those vaudevillian nicknames, like calling a guy tiny or a bald guy curly. I didn't even... I didn't even... <laughs> ah, yes, my favorite nickname. Old curls. Sound just break. But as best as I can tell, it's more likely he's just on the smaller side. I apologize. I realize this goes out as a podcast as well. It goes out on YouTube as a video. Also goes out as a podcast. I am a very, very bald man. <laughs> I have a big beard, but my head is bare. Not a hair on his head. You understand me? Eventually, Pedro proposed to Maria. It's unclear whether this was before or after he got her pregnant, but it is clear that he was still either 16 or 17 at the time. She accepted, but the wedding was never to be. Pedro had robbed a man named China, a rival gang leader, stealing weapons, money, and drugs. In retaliation, Maria was killed, still carrying their unborn child. Written on the wall, in her blood, were the words, We will get you. The Red Wedding Pedro was devastated, but he had no idea who had committed the murder. The man, <laughs> I guess he does have a lot of enemies, right? But it's also like you just murdered the head of a rival drug gang. Maybe it was that China dude. Maybe. The man had a lot of enemies because that's the sort of thing that happens when you routinely kill gang members and steal their stuff. Fair. It's probably not the only gang leader he's killed. Dude, you are living some dangerous life. This is a breaking bad. 
He also realized that he was in danger. He had been Maria's right-hand man and had seen her as invincible, but now she was dead and there was no one to protect him. Pedro fled to another town to live with his aunt and uncle, where he was introduced to Candombo. His aunt and uncle explained that Candombo was a religion that would cleanse his spirit and offer him protection. This seemed great, as his previous protector was now gone. There were two rituals involved, and considering there's a lot of graphic stuff involving animal sacrifice, I'd really rather not get into the details. I'm I'm with you, Kevin. I totally agree. But I mean, eh, we've not been too graphic today, to be fair. Let's carry on. Suffice to say that there was some amount of drinking of blood and a bunch of organs where they didn't belong. Oh my lord! And at the end of the second ritual, Pedro put on a necklace made of hardened seeds. I mean, all right. I get like the previous one was like a powerful drug dealer. She could protect you. What can't protect you is weird spirits. <laughs> At this point, he said he felt as if he was possessed. He seemed to already be of the mind that he could never be held accountable for his actions, but after this act of possession, Pedro felt invincible. Knives would bounce off him and bullets couldn't harm him. Or so he thought. It was also at this point that he decided to fully embrace his delusions as a hero. Pedro began robbing food trucks and giving the food to the poor, burning down businesses that laundered drug money, and murdering anyone who hurt women. He was like Robin Hood, but just with a lot more murder. But this whole time, he was also trying to track down Maria's murderer. For a full year, he would confront, torture, and kill enemies, trying to get answers. There were too many enemies to track down, and he was still no closer to identifying his fiancé's killer. Then one night, he was drinking in a bar, and Pedro was approached by a woman. She was the ex-girlfriend of China, and told him that China was the one who had ordered the hit on Maria. He was furious at both China for what he had done, but also at himself for not realizing it. I know I made it clear earlier who the killer was, but we have no idea exactly how long it was between Pedro robbing China and China murdering Maria. Nor do we know what crimes Pedro had pissed people off with in the interim. It's not unreasonable that he wouldn't have made the connection. Yeah, in the storyline, it kind of felt like he killed China and then his his uh, fiance dies. And I guess it just wasn't so clear cut. All that was left was to track China down, and he discovered that China and his family would be attending a wedding the following weekend. Pedro and two of his buddies, because apparently he still had some, rolled up to the wedding, guns in hand. They walked in and began opening fire. Some reports say they targeted the gang members, while others say they were firing indiscriminately. There may have been so many gang members in attendance that both could be true. Either way, the result was the same. Seven men dead, 16 injured. To celebrate a job well done, Pedro and his friends went to a bar at the wedding to have a drink. Oh my god, that is some gangster sh**. You shoot up a wedding and then you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Open bar, right? Ugh. After a massacre like that, Pedro had to lay low. It already killed 23 people that we know of, but there was one more murder left to commit. A few months after the massacre, he found out that his favorite cousin was pregnant, but her boyfriend refused to marry her. This insult against his family would not stand, so he shot and killed the boyfriend. Yeah, that's making the situation better for sure. Finally, on May the 24th, 1973, at the age of 18, Pedro was arrested. In the attempt to take him into custody, there was a firefight that saw Pedro wounded. He had passed out as a result of his injuries and woke up in a hospital surrounded by reporters. Apparently, word of his boasts about being a righteous killer had gotten around. The charges were read at trial, and Pedro was accused of 18 murders. Outraged, he turned to everyone in the courtroom and protested that it couldn't only be 18, and that he had killed at least 100 men. I'm sure his public defender was thrilled and that, in the end, he was only convicted of 14 of the murders, but he was sentenced to 126 years in prison. At long last, this vigilante killer would be taken off the streets and see some justice. Um, is this... Th I don't think this can be the end, because didn't we say he had, like, confirmed 70-some murders? So, is he gonna get out of prison, or is he just late? are they later just gonna find a whole bunch of bodies and that he was actually telling the truth? Oh my god, please don't get out of prison. People who've got sentenced to 126 years in prison should be in those inescapable prisons. Like, I don't know, that one where they put Batman. You know, he goes into the bottom and there's that big thing that he has. Oh, he did escape from that prison, didn't he? So it's kind of pointless. But like, but that, that one, but with a big cage over the top of the hole. <laughs> Problem solved. Or just someone constantly pouring some oil down those walls. So he like slips and he can't climb up. Although that's less than 10 years per murder conviction, so my American sensibilities tell me that's hardly enough justice. I know the accumulated total is well beyond his life expectancy, but still. Who's locked in with whom? 
Pedro was taken directly from the courthouse to a van to be transported to prison. It must have been a busy day at court because another man who had been convicted of rape was also being transported. The two convicts were handcuffed but in the back of a van by guards who escorted them to the prison. So a funny thing happens when you send a guy that claims to only murder criminals to jail. Actually, it started happening before they even reached the prison. When they arrived and the guards opened the back of the van, only Pedro was still alive. He had killed the other convict with his bare hands despite the handcuffs. Holy sh! You're just loose in there? You're not like tied down to the bench or something? <laughs> Holy sh! This was going to be quite the theme throughout his incarceration. Wait, I just realized, isn't he getting out because don't we say the Brazilian Punisher turned YouTuber? At some point, this dude's gonna escape from Britain. Also, isn't this taking place like back in the day? Yeah, this is like 1970s. So is he gonna spend like decades in jail and then this is so this is a long like happening over a long period of time then brazilian prisons are not nice places <laughs> they are underfunded overcrowded and unsanitary inmates frequently aren't even given mattresses to sleep on and there could be 20 men crammed into a single cell okay lesson for everybody don't commit crimes don't commit crimes but especially don't commit cr commit crimes in brazil they were also violent, with murders and gang violence being all too common. Guards often wouldn't even enter the prison, allowing the criminal hierarchy to do the policing for them. Not only was this not a nice place to be in general, but Pedro had a huge target on his back. First of all, he had a metric ton of enemies. <laughs> He's literally spent his entire life since he was just turning to be a teenager making powerful enemies who murder people. And a lot of them were in prison with him. Yeah, in a second, even those who didn't know him had resentment because of his borderline celebrity status with the media. He was a ruthless killer, but the media had bought into the narrative that he only killed awful people who deserved it. This was likely aided by the fact that unlike most serial killers, there was nothing ritual about his killings. Serial killers will often mutilate their bodies, stage them in specific poses, or violate the body sexually. Pedro did none of that. He shot or stabbed them, and then they were dead. The cold, hitman-like nature of the killings really helped his message that he wasn't a depraved serial killer. These were just bad people, and they needed to be dealt with efficiently. He would stray from this on only one occasion, but we'll get to that later. No sooner had Pedro set foot in the prison than a group of five men decided to make an example of him. They surrounded him, knives or shivs in hand, and attacked. When all was said and done, three of the attackers were killed, and the other two were seriously wounded. However, Pedro also learned that his weird religious ritual had not made him as impervious to knives as he previously thought thought as his face had been cut and scarred still pretty impressive for one dude against five yeah he killed three of them and put two of them in the hospital <laughs> this dude and isn't he supposed to be short this dude's like that dude who you like you know you just sit you just look at him and you're like don't mess with that guy <laughs> he's a psycho the five men had wanted to send a message and they did the message was don't with Pedro. Now locked in prison with nothing but bad people around him, he might have faced some sort of decision paralysis. There were so many people that needed to die. How could he choose? The easiest way was to outsource the decision. This wasn't actually Pedro's plan, it was just a side effect of his reputation. While incarcerated, he would receive fan letters and multiple marriage requests, which isn't too uncommon for a serial killer. Well, it isn't too uncommon, but it is absolutely unusual. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Yeah, fair. That makes no Sense. In addition to his fan mail, Pedro also started receiving requests to kill specific inmates. Writing a letter wasn't a surefire way to see someone die, but he did carry out a number of these hits requested by the public. Presumably the people being targeted were the worst of the worst, but that's not necessarily true for everyone who was killed. To start, not everyone in prison is a murderer or rapist. They weren't even necessarily guilty. It wasn't uncommon for people to spend years in a Brazilian prison simply awaiting trial. It's like, why are you here? Oh, I've killed like at least least 20 people. Why are you here? Oh, I'm waiting. I, I nicked a chocolate bar a few times and uh, I'm waiting on my trial. <laughs> Both of you are bad people and you shall be murdered by Pedro the Punisher. Pedro could have easily killed an innocent person awaiting trial or someone wrongfully convicted. He was hardly doing his due diligence, pretty much just relying on his first impression of a person. Secondly, his motives could be completely unrelated to the crimes the person who committed. One cellmate of Pedro's had the unfortunate and uncon uncontrollable issue of snoring too loudly, and thus his life was forfeit. On another occasion, he believed another inmate had been spying on him during a conjugal visit. I hope it was the greatest show he ever watched, because it was also the last thing he ever saw. 
door. Oh my god. Also, what are you doing? Why are conjugal visits a thing? Especially for this guy. What the f***? After killing 10 people while in prison, enough was enough. It was time for Pedro to be transferred to a different prison so he could kill people there instead. I don't want to laugh, but what the f***? Put him in a hole and leave him there. Nothing makes f***ing sense. This time, it's personal. It was just another ordinary day in prison for Pedro. I just imagine all ordinary days like, who are we going to murder today? <laughs> Such a selection. It's like a buffet of criminals. I just don't know who to choose. When he out of the blue got some devastating news, his mother had been murdered, stabbed 21 times. The guilty party was his father. He was given the opportunity to attend his mother's funeral because it was so close to the prison and because the warden probably didn't want to find out what would happen if he said no. <laughs> Dude. Is Pedro going to murder his dad at his mum's funeral? That's going to be intense. Pedro attended the funeral in handcuffs and over his mother's coffin, he vowed to avenge her by killing his father and eating his f***ing heart. Dude. As luck and or poor planning would have it, Pedro Senior was sent to the same prison that Pedro was in. And you can shit your pants. What are you doing, Brazilian justice system? Are you smoking crack? They had the forethought to at least put him in a different cell block as if there was any chance that would be enough to save his life. Not that it really sounds like it was worth saving. Maybe they put it there and be like, yeah, I'll be murdered by his son. Oh, no! <laughs> if I was... <laughs> imagine being a judge in Brazil and someone comes across your docket and the jury... Uh, I don't know if they have juries or whatever or however it works. But he's like, oh, man. Like... Life is not enough for this guy. Let's uh, let's send him to Pedro prison. <laughs> uh, let's let Pedro know what he did. Let's put him in the same cell. Because that judge now has access to the death penalty. In order to gain access to the rest of the prison, Pedro feigns being sick. When a guard entered his cell, Pedro grabbed him, put a knife to his throat, forcing the guard to hand over his gun and his keys. What are the... Dude, the prison people, the prison guards have guns? Are you insane, Brazil? <laughs> Prison guards don't have guns, right? Not the ones who could go to the cells. Like the ones in the tower or around the outside. Yeah, give them guns. Put some guns in like a big cage. Um, but dude, don't be patrolling the prison with a gun that a prisoner can take. Brazil, again, you smoking crack? What the f***? This was the only time that Pedro's murder would involve any sort of ritual. He entered his father's cell, without saying a word, stabbed Pedro Sr. 22 times, one more than the number of times it stabbed Pedro's mother. Pedro then cut out his heart, cut a piece of it, and chewed it before spitting it out onto his father's body. The way he tells the story, it sounds like he intended to eat the whole thing, but it was just too chewy. He then went back to his cell, released the guards, and returned the gun and the keys. I mean, I, I don't like this guy. This guy's a horrible piece of shit. But that is badass right there, my dude. If it wasn't obvious by now, the inmates were now the ones running the prison. Not only could they basically do whatever they wanted, they were also making the rules. Pedro talked in an interview about drugs and how they were everywhere in the prison, as to be expected. However, while weed and cocaine were plentiful, the inmates decided that the line had to be drawn at crack. You may be asking yourself, but aren't crack and cocaine the same thing? No, no, I wasn't asking myself that. I don't know what the difference between crack and cocaine is. And the answer is yes. I mean... Well, cracks made from cocaine. Are we talking about cocaine again? They're the same base substance, but crack is, unless I'm really wrong, crack is cooked from cocaine and it's a more uh, intense, short-lived, more addictive version of cocaine, right? Also cheaper, if I'm not mistaken. I've never done crack. <laughs> Shocking statement there. The difference comes from the fact that crack is smoked. This results in effects being felt faster, but for a shorter amount of time, which increases the risk of addiction. Big brain Simon. But I think they also do something. It's not just like you roll, you know, it's not like you're sprinkling cocaine in a, in a, in a, uh, what's it called when you mix it with tobacco? Not a blunt, but a spliff. It's not like you're sp sprinkling cocaine in with your tobacco in a spliff and smoking it. You have to cook the crack first, right? 
The intensified addiction is what caused the inmates to ban the substance, having seen too many comrades lose their lives to the drug. The guards were helpless to stop the flow of contraband into the prison, but the convicts had no difficulty enforcing their ban on crack. Anyway, it seemed as though Pedro was unstoppable. There was nothing he couldn't do, and no one he couldn't kill. While he was in prison, he killed 47 people, including- Put him in a hole! What are you doing, prison system? 47?! including his own father. However, there is one person that he doesn't like to talk about, the one who got away. In 1998, news broke in the prison that Francisco de Assis Pereira, also known as the Park Maniac, was going to be serving his sentence there. I feel like this is old judgy judge. He knows. He's like, where are we sending him? Send him to the Pedro prison. In the span of two years, he'd raped and murdered 11 women in Sao Paulo Park and raped nine more who he didn't kill. If there was one thing Pedro hated more than murderers, not counting himself, it was the people who hurt women. He was determined to murder Francisco the day he arrived in prison. Yeah, I'm down with that. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, he wasn't the only one who had that idea. Some far less capable inmates started a riot in an attempt to get at Francisco, but he was able to survive the attack and was immediately transferred to another facility where he's still alive to this day. It's kind of a shame, isn't it? <laughs> My bloodlust is strong. But, like all good things, and also bad things, his killing spree had come to an end. The guards may not have a lot of control over the prison, but eventually Pedro would force their hand. Someone started a nasty rumor about one of Pedro's friends that resulted in that friend being murdered by another inmate. He blamed the person that started that rumor and swore to get his revenge. It turned out that the person that started the rumor was a transgendered person, and they were kept in their own part of the prison. Pedro gained access, as he always does, and once there, he decided that he didn't like any transgendered people, so he went completely out of his mind. He did succeed in killing the person he had come for, and then he killed 15 more people in that room. He killed 15 people in a room in a prison. In what I assume is a more protected part of the prison. What the actual f- is going on in the Brazilian prison system? Because how is that even a real thing? Pedro was able to describe the event in a way I find far more brutal than any graphic description of violence. When he described the incident, he said that the ordeal left him deaf for three days because of all of the victims screaming. (laughs) I have no words, Pedro. What the f***, man? Finally, the prison decided that enough was enough. (laughs) Oh yeah, I only took 47 murders and then 15 people in one day. Sorry, 16. 15 plus 1. My lord. Sure, maybe Pedro had already killed 31 people while locked up. But that was over the course of like two decades. Oh, I'm sorry, it was 31 plus this 16, bringing it to 47. To kill 60 people in one day? That was entirely too much killing, and it needed to be stopped. He was submitted to a psychiatric evaluation where it was deemed that he was a psychopath, incapable of feeling remorse. He wasn't just any psychopath, though. He is described as being the perfect psychopath. It's always nice to hear that you've reached the top of your field. See, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Following that evaluation, Pedro would spend the next 10 years in isolation. He had, at at most, one hour per day out of his cell to exercise under the watchful eye of two armed guards who were instructed to shoot him if he took one step out of line. For 10 years, he sat alone in a room, reading, exercising, playing solitaire, and punching a bag of sand. And quite possibly the only time in all of recorded history, isolation actually worked. He was released back into Gen Pop after those 10 years but he never killed again. When when are we getting to the part where this guy makes YouTube videos? Like, (laughs) what is going on? How are we going to fit this in? We're almost like, I'd say we're 80% through. Brazilian Law and You Pedro had originally been sentenced to 126 years in prison as a result of the additional 47 murders. He committed while in prison, he was sentenced to another 400 years. The thing is, those giant numbers are completely meaningless. Under Brazilian law, there's no such thing as a life sentence in prison. Such a notion was considered inhumane, and to the maximum amount of time a person could spend behind bars was 30 years. What if you murder someone on, like, day year 29? <laughs> day 364? Uh, <laughs> what? The other 496 years for which he was sentenced were just for show. He was released from prison on April 24th. <laughs> Brazilian justice system? I understand why you have a maximum sentence. But then if someone commits a crime more recently, then then they, they reset, surely. You what the f <laughs> you can't release this guy. He's killed 70 people or whatever it is. Sorry, 47, but then I know it's more because at the the beginning. Or is he going to kill more people since he's been released? Oh my god. 
However, after four years, he was picked up again and charged with rioting and false imprisonment while he had been in jail. He had not committed any crime since his, he was released. He was sentenced to another 128 years in prison. Wait, so after four years? He had four years out? It's not bad. But he would only serve seven of them as a result of that same Brazilian law. There are conflicting reports, but for the latter sentence, he may have been under house arrest rather than imprisoned. Either way, as of 2018, he's a completely free man. For anyone wondering, I'm sure there are a lot of you. Yes, the Brazilian law regarding prison sentences has been revised. As of 2019, the maximum time for imprisonment has increased from 30 to 40 years. But maybe they're onto something. Despite Pedro's life of crime and particularly murder, he seems to have turned over a new leaf. Somehow, isolation worked. That leaves only one question. <laughs> Is this guy... Who has killed so many people making videos on YouTube? <laughs> now, right? <laughs> Holy sh! Where are they now? Pedro was arrested in 1973 at the age of 18. He finally became a free man in 2018 at the age of 63. The world was a much different place than he left it, and you might think that it'd take quite a while to adjust how much it was had changed. But you'd be wrong, because he did what any sexagenarian in his shoes would do, and he started a YouTube channel. Okay, so the idea wasn't exactly his. It came from his 30-year-old friend, Pablo Silva. Pablo recorded and produced the videos, but it was all about Pedro. Within two years, they had over 150,000 subscribers and 8 million views on their channel. In the channel's About section, it said that, In this channel, you will know and follow the life of the greatest serial killer in Brazil. So what sort of content was Pedro producing? As one of history's most prolific serial killers who what could he possibly produce other than true crime content wait a minute what does that say about us simon <laughs> i'd say that most true crime youtubers are not serial killers kevin jesus <laughs> but yes it's true pedro would comment on and discuss the current crimes taking place in brazil from a true crime standpoint in many of his videos the rest of his videos were your run-of-the-mill lifestyle blog where you can watch him cook <laughs> get a haircut or do random chores around the house i'm not sure why this is a genre that people watch but apparently it's pretty popular yeah it is isn't it as successful as the channel was something must have happened at the beginning of the year between pedro and pablo suddenly the channel was rebranded and videos were deleted overnight the channel lost millions of views as all the videos featuring pedro vanished pedro has since started his own channel and since january has amassed 26,000 subscribers and 70, 750,000 views in addition to his own channel he frequently appears on brazilian podcasts which receive hundreds of thousands if not millions of views each for anyone interested in checking any of these videos out fair warning they're all in portuguese without subtitles except for the occasional three minute excerpt from a two-hour podcast when he is making a public spectacle of himself pedro works as a housekeeper and enjoys a quiet life on his farm perhaps if he hadn't felt it necessary to kill everyone who looked at him funny all those people would be doing the same thing yeah don't forget this guy killed many dozens dozens of people wrap up when this episode was recommended to be by isabel santos in the comments of another video and let that be your reminder to let us know who you want to see in the comments i did a cursory search of pedro before pitching it to simon everything that came up at first glance talked about how he was a serial killer that had only targeted murderers and rapists it looks like i was go it was going to be a really fun episode and in fact that's exactly what i told simon it was going to be oh my god i have to say kevin <laughs> this was probably so long ago because we're so far ahead on this channel and i have so many scripts floating around that i have absolutely no recollection of this conversation it's either that or the brain disease unfortunately the deeper into my research i got the much less fun i found the whole story pedro told the story that he only killed bad people and the media ate it up and to be fair most of them probably were but that's not because he was a meticulous killer who operated under a strict code it's because he was surrounded by bad people he grew up surrounded by violence lived a life of violent crime and went to prison with violent criminals just playing the odds you could shoot pretty much any Anyone he met in his first 63 years and they'd probably be an overall terrible person the unfortunate truth is that pedro killed because he wanted to in interviews he talks about his need to kill if he went long if he went too long without killing he would become anxious and unable to sleep pedro was straight up addicted to murder he also likes to contradict himself to try and spin the narrative to his advantage despite being admitted he killed for pleasure he would try to sell it as being done for the greater good because these were terrible people that needed to die he would also go on about how he was doing the righteous thing and helping people, claiming, despite his earlier statements, that he took no pleasure in killing. The whole time he would be making these justifications, clearly visible on his arm was a tattoo that said, I love to kill. A tattoo that he had many years to remove, but apparently never felt it necessary to do so. 
I briefly mentioned this earlier about the Brazilian prison system, but another important thing to mention is that not everyone he killed had even gone to trial. Of the 47 people in kill- he killed in prison, 36% of them hadn't yet been convicted of a crime. It's not to say they couldn't be murderers or rapists, and perhaps their reputations preceded them. It just seems like Pedro was more concerned with making sure people knew he only killed bad people, rather than making sure it was actually true. Yeah, because he just liked to kill. He liked to kill. That's all there is to it. He liked killing and there just happened to be bad people to kill which is better than killing good people no doubt you know it's better than like pedro lopez the other pedro who just killed children so this you know (laughs) but still don't murder (laughs) if there's any moral to be had here it's that life will never be as cut and dry as fiction people love characters like dexter or the boondog saints because they have a code of ethics that is infallible we see shortcomings in our criminal justice systems and these characters promise to right the wrongs and make sure that evil is punished sadly that's just not how reality works despite it being fairly popular tv trope pedro seems to be the closest we've gotten to an actual serial killer and he leaves quite a lot to be desired in this regard. Maybe this is why isolation actually worked in his case. He had a severe addiction to killing, and the only way to cure him was to force him to quit cold turkey. And maybe someday we'll get the serial killer we deserve, an incorruptible vigilante who only brings vengeance upon the truly wicked. Who knows? Maybe that hero will be you. For legal reasons, that is sardonicism and not an endorsement of murder. Yeah, holy <laughs> shit, Kevin. I was like, where are you going with this, mate? Don't do that. How about the justice system does the justice? No one sh- Don't be a vigilante. That is the line of casual criminalists. Do not be a vigilante. For God's sake. That is the official line because it's the law. Uh, thank you so much for watching. This has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. I've been your host, Simon. Kevin, thank you for writing. Jen, thank you for editing. And I'll see you next time.